All right, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, a little short session about the FIG, uh, the Framework Interoperability Group, the organization that tries to make the PHP ecosystem a little easier and nicer to work with. Uh, my name is Bart. Uh, I live in Amsterdam. Um, this is my Drupal org handle if you want to look me up. I'm uh, primarily a backend developer currently working for Druid. Uh, we built uh, Drupal sites, um, some Symfony-based applications. Um, and that's partly where my interest for uh, the FIG comes from and what they do, because uh, a lot of the standards that they produce, a lot of the, the conventions uh, we use in Drupal and for our uh, non-Drupal-specific projects. So the idea is, behind all this talk, that we all publish lots of software. We write tons of it. We, we write patches for Drupal. Um, we write our own libraries and packages. We write our own um, entire applications, like I said. What we do at Druid is sometimes we build Symfony applications. Um, and there's all this code has to go somewhere. Um, we want to use other people's code. We want our code to be reusable to other people. So there's a lot of stuff moving around. And, and the important part here is that is the moving around. Like our code goes to other projects. Other projects' code ends up in our projects. And that kind of, we need to figure out, or we needed in the past, to figure out a way how to make all of this work together a little more nicely. Um, that's partly what the FIG aims to do still. So let's start with things were difficult. Uh, back in the day, it was like if someone used other conventions that you did, it was really hard to pull in other packages. That wasn't really um, an easy way before Composer and, and all these standards to quickly publish a little package of your own. Um, kind of felt like a hurdle for a lot of people. Um, the developments of the last few years have resulted in many, many more reusable small packages being published and, and maintained uh, rather than a couple of like, monolithic bigger packages or ecosystems. So the first rule of reusability is don't repeat yourself. Um, good thing is that it also applies sort of the other way around. Don't repeat other people's work if you can help it. Um, there again comes the reuse in the picture. Um, if someone else wrote something that you, that's good for you to use, um, and we did that in Drupal 8 with a couple of systems that we, uh, we took out of Drupal core and we replaced them with packages from other systems. Uh, a very good example is our old Drupal HTTP request uh, function, which was like a really shitty, badly supported HTTP 1.0 client, which we threw out and completely replaced with Guzzle, which is uh, an amazingly powerful and flexible HTTP client that is up to date and well maintained. So we didn't repeat it to ourselves. We didn't repeat anyone else's work either. We just used other people's work to support our own. Reuse is really important. Uh, that goes from small functions like that don't write the same 10 lines of code over and over if it's useful to put it in a function. Um, but it applies to big ecosystems as well, because duplication is problematic. It's hard to maintain control over something that is, has been duplicated. Um, if you have the same code in multiple places and it has the same bug in it, try, fix it, try remembering to fix it in all these different places. Um, things can you know, get out of control, run away. It's, it's not really useful. Oh. So, We've got these concepts. We don't want to, re we don't want to repeat ourselves or other people are going to reuse. Um, but in order to reuse things from others and to allow our produced code to be reused by other people, they need to work together. They need to be interoperable. Um, there's a nice little definition on the screen that I took from the dictionary. Um, and like, the cables illustrate that. Like, if you have a ton of different connections or connectors on your computer, try finding one that matches. Uh, Apple's trying to be at the forefront of solving this when it comes to connectors um, by just making everything USB-C now, sort of. Uh, we're trying to solve it on a, on a software level. Make sure that the thing that I write works with the thing that Larry writes. Um, if we publish something together, that it is easily reusable and easy to connect to someone else's framework or, or application. And that you have, to, you have to specify the standards for doing this. You have to make sure that the little piece of the, the little line where the two packages meet, that they are the same. And you do that with standards. Um, actually, my OK, I've got speaker slides here, and they're not in the right order for some reason. 
Uh, so what does Drupal do for interoperability? Or what has Drupal done in the past for interoperability? So one thing is coding standards. Uh, we spend more time reading code than writing code. Um, so, apart, so coding standards and styles. So apart from the fact that um, it must be nice and easy to read, like having some consistency makes it easier to spot problems. Coding standards also can enforce uh, simpler ways of doing things, uh, making sure that code doesn't become too complex. Uh, a lot of standards say you, you can't have code that is more than a certain characters on the same line. So if you end up having a complex if statement, your coding standard will probably make you think about the complexity of that thing and help you hopefully motivate, to, motivate you to take that apart into something that is more readable, more maintainable. Um, and this is all for humans. Like when we read our own code, each other's code, um, and reading your own code is really just the same thing as reading someone else's code, because six months from now, you don't know what you wrote now. The other thing is APIs. Um, and in the, in the, this is the, the, the coding part of interoperability. We want to make sure that another human can just not read my code, but can also easily use it. So conventions are important for understanding each other's work, but also using each other's work. Um, and we've done this in Drupal for years, for, for as long as I can remember. Uh, that's at least a decade in Drupal. We've had all these conventions to make sure that the different modules, the different pieces of code that we produce in the Drupal ecosystem work well together. And this is another very important concept that we've been trying within Drupal to promote. Don't fork someone else's module. Don't make a module that tries to be an, a complete solution. Instead, build on the smaller, smaller tools that people before you have built. Integrate your code with the entity API. Instead of building all kinds of custom list built functionality, make views plugins. Um, and then when you combine a couple of modules together, you get a fully functional forum instead of having a forum module, which we, do we still have that in core? We still have a forum module in core. And the fact that I didn't even remember is probably, a, uh, yeah, an explanation as to, explains my point. Um, so when it comes to modules, they, that's the concept that Drupal's been using for, for over a decade. I don't know how, do you know? what the first version was that introduced the concept of modules? Uh, OK, so the, since the beginning. And modules are kind of comparable to composer packages. Um, and we were, we're getting to composer in a little bit. Uh, but they're basically the package management solution within Drupal. And we have standardized discovery of these extensions. We had uh, automated class loading in Drupal 7 in our own way. Um, we handle assets. We harden web servers by making sure that you can visit executable PHP files through your web server. We ship with default uh, IIS and Apache configuration. Um, so all these conventions make sure that things work together and things work properly. Um, and as you know, Drupal grew, and, and we as developers and contributors grew, because um, I've been very involved with the, the, the development of Drupal 8. I've seen it from pretty much the start to the end. And I've seen people learn and grow and become better at the things that they write and publish. Um, and as we as a community matured, we realized that a lot of our code is also not very specific to Drupal. Um, and this is, of course, you know, Drupal HTTP requests. HTTP requests, yeah, a lot of frameworks need to do that. But also the things that we did sort of need for ourselves can be reusable elsewhere. And in Drupal 8, we put that in the Drupal component namespace. And we're slowly getting our composer integration in order so that other software packages can use these generic tools that we published. So we're, we're, we've been doing a lot of things in core to make our own lives better and to sort of integrate with the wider community. But what really helped us, and that was in the beginning of the Drupal 8 cycle, was eventually the, um, uh, the start of the, the FIG and the first few standards that they produced. So the FIG is the Framework Interoperability Group. It began as a group of, of PHP frameworks that um, I'm part of imagining them sitting around the table and whining about their common problems and then finally deciding maybe we should solve them together. Um, so they've been coming up over the last few years, uh, and I say they, but it's, it's, it's very open, it's very community-like, um, more about that later. But if, like, the group, the, eco, the, the, the community around FIG has come up with a lot of standards that has made all these things that we just saw a lot easier for us in our daily lives. Um, and the awesome thing is that everything is open. So the standards are open source. The, the, they use these two licenses. Communication is open. Um, 
so you have a, uh, an IRC channel, you have a mailing list, uh, you can um, ask questions, you can uh, just lurk, you can uh, work on proposals with other people. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that you can do to influence what the fig produces, you can do without, yeah, not, without having a very special status. Eventually it needs to be passed or confirmed by people who do have a special status, but there's a, a lot of contribution that you can do without being officially involved really much. Um, and now I want to welcome Larry Garfield into the room. Um, so as, as we said, the fig consists of PHP frameworks. Originally, uh, it's a little wider now. Um, I think that presently with fig 3, you don't even have to be a PHP project to be a member as long as you have... It's an organization with a heavy best interest in the PHP. Yeah. I, I read the, the new bylaws. That, um, so the, the, the FIG as an organization changed the structure over the course of the summer. Um, so some things have been changed a little bit. And I think originally you had to be a PHP project. And now it's, yeah, so it's a little looser now. Um, but all member projects have a representative. Larry is ours. Um, and there are a couple dozen projects that are members of the FIG organization. Um, new members can be approved by existing members. Uh, uh, members can be kicked out by existing members. Um, not really going into the organizational structure too much, um, but it's kind of like a football club, sort of. Um, is it really official? Is it registered as an entity, the FIG? We should look into that at some point. Okay, so it, it's fairly unofficial, um, but like the way the workflows are all on paper, there are bylaws. Um, to make sure, that, to ensure that things go fairly smoothly. Um, so quite professional, even though it's not a legal entity, not a company, not a, a registered organization. Um, actually, the first uh, item on this list is uh, not entirely correct anymore with the FIG3. Um, FIG3 has what is called a core committee that um, decides whether or not a proposal is initially accepted is something that the FIG wants to work on. And they also sign off on the proposal at the very end of the, 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 yeah, the design process when everybody has been, is done working on finalizing the proposal. Um, the, sometimes uh, it's just a bunch of rules in a document. Sometimes they make actual PHP interfaces. So once all that work is done, the FIG also signs off again. Um, so I, that first line is a little outdated at this point. And the really cool thing is that members are not required to do everything that the FIG does. They can sit back and sit something out. Like if they don't, they don't have an interest in a certain standard, they can say, okay, we're not, you know, we're, we're letting other people pull this card and, and use what is eventually produced because it's not relevant to us in this specific case. Um, and this is very, very apparent in the new FIG 3 structure where instead of every project getting a vote or, or, or being allowed uh, into the working group that works on a PSR, there's more focus for, uh, on getting the right experts into a working group. Um, so it's a little easier to sit back as a project. It's a little clearer how that works. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for why you don't want to implement any of the standards, any of the recommendations that the FIG produces. Sometimes you can just disagree with it, and sometimes it, implementing it would break your stuff. Uh, coding standards can you know, uh, break a number of pull requests or patches. Um, PSR 7, which we'll see a little later, is about HTTP request handling. Yeah, by the time Drupal 8 was stabilized, was frozen, we already had a system in place, so adopting the new standard uh, would have broken our original code. So that might be something for a future version like Drupal 9. Uh, there are adapters available for the different packages, so you can use it, but we don't do it out of the box. So about the, this was about the background and why you would want to do this. So, sorry? Drupal 8 does check the PSR 7 brief module. Okay, um, as, do we explicitly require it or is it a dependency of a dependency? We put it in explicitly and have some code in there to work with it. So okay, see, PSR I've been a little bit too much out of the loop apparently. Um, so enough about how the organization works and why this is so great. So what do they produce? They produce PSRs. Really, really nice abbreviation. Basically means a PHP standard recommendation. And it's purposely not called a standard, because we don't want to you know, pretend that we know that this is the standard that everybody should use, but it's a recommendation. It's a standard, and we recommend that you use it to improve your interoperability with other projects and people, but you don't have to. They are named PSR dash and then a number. And the number is pretty arbitrary, um, except for the fact that it just counts up. 
if an, the latest proposal, I think, is 14 or 15, if the next one comes in, it, 17. it's 17. So the next one to be proposed and accepted would be 18. Doesn't really care if it was started five years ago and now only finally accepted. The moment it comes in, it gets the next number. Um, if a PSR includes code, uh, so there is a, a, a PSR for logging, it comes with a PHP interface, um, that is exposed as a composer package. Uh, you can pull it in as a dependency of your project and then use the code. Um, and the code and documentation is all hosted on GitHub. It's open source, as we saw earlier, it's released under the MIT license of the code. Um, so you can pull it into any open source or any closed source or commercial project if you want to. So the PSRs that have been accepted, um, this is actually the, uh, the second set of PSRs. The first one was zero, but we'll see that in a few slides. It's, not, it's in order in a certain way. So PSR1 was the original coding standard PSR that says you need to know me constants like this, your classes like that. PSR2 built on that with a more coding style approach, like use this, use this kind of indentation. Um, so PSR1 is really functional, like it changes your actual logical code. PSR2 is purely cosmetic. However, officially, if you want to use PSR2, you must also adopt PSR1 or a similar PSR, but it's still the only code, uh, coding standard PSR that we have. After that came PSR3, which was, um, I think maybe the second, yeah, it was the second really functional PSR after PSR0, which we'll see in the next slide, and it was about logging. Um, we all need to log system events, like little notices or confirmations, errors, warnings, emergencies. Um, so this interface, this is a standard that defines log levels, but also comes with a PHP interface, and uh, that's really useful, because if you need to log something, you can type hint on the interface. You can receive an object that implements this logger interface, and then just talk to it. You don't really care where the actual class came from. You don't really care how it logs it. You just, you know, just like with any other form of dependency injection, you just want to make sure that it, it logs. Um, and if all the logging libraries and backends use this standard, and all the code that wants to log something uses this standard and this interface, you can make all kinds of combinations of different applications with different logging backends, and it will still all work. This is the fifth, and at the same time also the first PSR. Um, PSR4 is basically sort of an extension on PSR0, uh, with a few weird things removed, a bit more flexibility. The real power is that it can automatically load classes that are located in files across your package. And the way we do that is by mapping directory names to namespace components, and the file that the class is in is named after the class, .php. Also means that you could only have one class per file, according to the standard. And if you build a project like that, then you can make an assumption. Oh, if I know which this, this namespace maps to this root directory, then from there on, everything that's in that namespace, I can automatically load because the file structure is predictable. This was really powerful um, because it allowed you to pull in another package that uses this standard, and including their code, loading their code, was predictable. So you didn't have to know anything about where the classes were located. As long as you had the class name, uh, the, the namespace and the class name, you could automatically load it. It was amazing. Um, actually, in Drupal 7, what we did, we had a database-powered class loader. So we had a database table, the registry, with a list of all kinds of files, which classes and interfaces were in there. And if you wanted to use a class or interface that wasn't in PHP's memory just yet, Drupal did a check to the database, um, would find the file that the, the class was found in earlier when it built the registry, included the file, and then you could use the class. Um, really funny, if you had um, a database error, with a class loading problem, which would then require the database to load the class's handling stuff. So you'd get, you'd get some database and class loading inception at, at points, plus it's just really slow. You have a whole registry. So if you have these conventions of knowing where something is, and you don't have to store a list, you don't have to store a manifest, you just know where to go. Uh, this one got in fairly recently, actually, I was surprised to see. Um, caching interface. Hmm, okay, and it's been a while since I updated these slides until now. Um, caching, everybody needs to do caching, uh, saving things, getting things from the cache. Um, 
just like with logging, they made an interface for that and that makes a lot of the caching uh, use cases a lot easier and you can more easily swap caching backends. PSR7 is really powerful uh, because a lot of the things that the software we build, they're web applications. And a web application, whatever it does, the one thing that it always does is it receives requests and it gives you responses. So that's one of the fairly obvious points where you'd like to create a standard to make it easier to deal with. Um, we use Symphony system now, um, but there are other uh, um, yeah, request and response handling frameworks. This tries to unify it a little bit so that um, we could potentially swap out certain components in Drupal, for instance, if we depend on this interface fully, um, and use another library for handling our requests. Uh, this one is also authored by Larry, Hypermedia Links, um, relations between documents on the internet. Um, it's basically, uh, if you've done a lot of front end, like a lot of similar uh, hypermedia relationship tools are available there as well. Um, go a little faster because we're running out of time. Um, also from, from Larry, um, this is the ones we saw before are officially accepted standard recommendations. Uh, I left out the ones that are still in draft because there are quite a few of them. This is the only one that's a draft and that will never actually become accepted, but I kind of wanted to show it because there's a sense of humor in the fig as well. There are all people uh, trying to do, to solve problems that we encounter on a daily basis. Um, so I find, this, I find this very important to mention. Um, it's not just some distant commercial entity. It's a bunch of people that a lot, you know, some people we know um, who spend their time on figuring these things out. So enough about PSRs. Uh, this is the last slide, so we're almost done. Composer. I mentioned it before. Where in Drupal we had modules for you know, 15 years now, um, they're actually packages for Drupal. Composer is a generic PHP package manager. So it can handle packages that are Drupal modules, but it can also handle packages that are uh, WordPress plugins, for instance. Like you could make that happen, like anything, um, as long as it is in one of the repositories that you configure, or the standard one. And what really, really made Composer extremely powerful, maybe even possible, was the auto-loading standard, PSR0, because that made it possible to pull in a package and automatically know how you could use the code in that package um, without having to dig into it. If you've used Composer and you dive into the, the folder where it stores all the packages, um, you'll notice that it's, it's really deep. Like Nobody has to go into that folder on production. Um, and that's, that's why auto-loading. Things happen for you automatically without having to know anything about the internals of the package. Um, Composer has grown to be more than a, just a package manager. Uh, there are, uh, are asset management tools like Pulley uh, built on top of it. Um, it can do some code base building things with, with, with custom scripts that you can fire before or after installing a package. Um, and it, for us, as Drupal people, this basically replaces Drush Make. Um, Drush Make is a, a, a Drupal specific, used to be a Drupal specific um, package manager that just did modules and themes and profiles. Um, in a really basic way, um, Composer is much more powerful, and because more and more modules are now depend, uh, requiring PHP packages that aren't Drupal modules, um, they ship with a Composer file that lists, and that means you have to install these modules through Composer. Um, you can't really use Composer and Drushmake together. You technically can, but it's a bit of a recipe for disaster. So, practically speaking, practically speaking, in Drupal 8, Composer is the way to go, replaces Drushmake, and opens up the gates to a wider PHP ecosystem. Um, so, if you're a little skeptical about this, modules like Rules and Drupal Commerce, um, and there are tons of others already required Composer packages. Uh, so if you want to use any of them when they become available, you have to use Composer. So um, if you stick around for a few more days here, it's the perfect place to start playing with it. Um, at the sprints, there are so many people who can help you out if you're stuck. End of this very short presentation. Um, PHP World has become a lot more exciting since all of this came out. Uh, a lot more accessible, not just because the language is easy to use, as people always say about PHP, but the tools that we use are much more accessible. Uh, if you want to know more about the FIG, check out their website. It's, uh, it's pretty slick. Uh, got a couple of good overviews of the things they do, how they work, what they produce. This is me, in case you want to hit me up with questions afterwards. If you don't want to hit me up later, do you have any questions right now? 
No? Then I think um, we're going to give the next speaker the floor. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the weekend. <laughs>